Today my guest is Mateusz Piskorski, the most famous political prisoner in Poland who was locked up in custody in the years 2016-2019 for the terrible anti-state crime of shaping opinions. Hello Mateusz and I hope that you will also shape our opinion today. Hello, nice to talk to you again and uh, well, uh, I would like to use this possibility to thank you as well as several other comrades and friends uh, from uh, friends from uh, many other countries who helped uh, I mean, during the hard time when I was uh, behind the bars and who helped to uh, promote a huge uh, action, a huge uh, information campaign, which really helped uh, to release me from that. So, as a former political prisoner, I once more would like to thank you, Michal, and uh, all the all the others. Uh, you know your names, I won't mention all of them. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we still, as you know, have uh, several political prisoners in Poland, but we shall talk, I think, about the uh, political regime here um, uh, on uh, several, using several examples of, of, of people who are being repressed, who are being imprisoned by uh, the Polish regime, uh, because it's always worthy to talk about it uh, for the English-speaking audience, I think. Uh, I think that there are some myths uh, surrounding Poland and that uh, almost no one uh, recognizes the fact that uh, Poland is, uh, well, becoming worse and worse, and uh, it's already an authoritarian state, of course. Okay, so it is the question which I wanted to ask uh, later. Uh, so maybe about the repression, censorship, uh, and all this stuff we'll talk later. And now I would like to ask you about the few basic changes which are taking place one year after the war. So a year has passed since the outbreak of war in Ukraine. And my first question concerns Polish society. A year ago, Pol Poles demonstrated their solidarity with, youth, with Ukraine on many state buildings as well as in private apartments yellow blue ukrainian flags fluttered in the windows and balconies polls reported on mass to places where refugees from ukraine were staying and helped them they delivered food clothes and invited ukrainians to their homes as a sign of solidarity with ukraine polish media changed their sign to yellow and blue does this love for ukraine last at last all the time is the Polish society, like the Polish government, ready, are ready to give Ukraine the last tank and the last plane? Are Poles ready to live in poverty as part of solidarity with Ukraine? Well, it's a very interesting question because lately we have some opinion polls published in Poland. The opinion polls which were ordered by uh, Warsaw Enterprise Institute, it's a think tank which is uh, sponsored by the US, by some uh, American foundations. Uh, and, uh, well, uh, around, I'll give you an example, around 65% uh, of uh, those who took part in the opinion polling uh, are against any kind of uh, sending weapon or uh, money or sponsoring the Ukrainian military. Uh, more than 70% people are against uh, Polish participation in uh, any kind of military actions there in Ukraine. 26% of uh, Poles, according to this uh, opinion poll, uh, are convinced that uh, the whole tragic war which we see now there was uh, basically caused by NATO and US expansion. So uh, I would be quite uh, optimistic because uh, more and more people here in Poland are starting to understand uh, what's going on uh, from the point of view of international relations, also from the point of view of their own interests. Uh, of course, you have mentioned uh, the solidarity and the solidarity from the first months of uh, after the war broke, I mean, after this stage of war broke out. 
because uh, we should remember that the war is going on since 2014. Yes, we should remember about Donbass. We should remember what was happening there, happening there uh, with the people in Donetsk, in in other cities. They were under uh, everyday um, uh, artillery attack. They were killed, massively killed, and so on. So, so the war is not something new which started uh, on the 24th of February 2022, yes? It's something which is uh, going on since nine years almost. Anyway, uh, well, I think that... Is, but we can say that if we consider the uh, uh, war in Ukraine like a war between the Western countries and Russia, we can say that it's never finished. This war is since the uh, Second World War, that, that it is the Cold War never finished. Mm, well, there was a certain moment uh, in the 90s when uh, the yeah. Cold War finished because... Why? Because... Uh, uh, Russia, the first Soviet Union, then Russia was completely destroyed. And uh, uh, I think that uh, one of the main goals of, of the US, uh, the Anglo-Saxons at that time, was to keep Russia as it was during the Yeltsin times. Yes? So, so uh, plundered, robbed uh, and uh, destroyed by the oligarchs and by the international capital. So, so this is uh, a small moment. You remember that guy, uh, Charles uh, Krauthammer, an American uh, journalist and writer who claimed that uh, uh, it was a kind of unipolar moment in the history of the world, the 90s. Yes, yes, but, then... yes, but in the same time, the President Putin one time mentioned that the uh, Chechenians uh, guerrillas were founded and sponsored by the Western countries. So it is continuity. Of course, because one of the main goals of uh, the people who shaped the Amer American foreign policy and uh, American geopolitics, the so-called deep state or deep government, uh, we, we might call them, uh, is to keep Russia weak. And uh, at a certain moment when Russia refused to um, have such a minor status uh, as it had during Yeltsin times, I think it was around 2007-2008, uh, after the famous speech of Putin at uh, Munich uh, Security Conference, uh, the West uh, realized that it has to strike Russia even harder. So first it provoked Georgia, as we remember, in 2008 uh, for, the, for the war in South Ossetia. Then uh, it was uh, provoking uh, the coup d'etat in uh, uh, Kiev in 2014, and now we have, of course, the actually this is not a Russo-Ukrainian war. Yes, this is a as you as you told this this is a war between uh, the so-called collective West, as uh, well, let's say the Anglo-Saxon with the Anglo-Saxon uh, pivot uh, controlling uh, the so-called West, and uh, Russia on the other hand, of course. Nevertheless, back to to the question. Uh, you asked about uh, uh, people in Poland and their behavior. I don't think it was solidarity with uh, Ukraine as a state. It was rather a solidarity, kind of solidarity with the people yes, who, who really came here. Uh, they don't have refugee status because uh, that's quite interesting. But you know how many Ukrainian refugees do we have in Poland? I mean, we can't rest. Yeah, a few, a few, a few hundreds, a few hundreds, yes, and uh, uh, all the others, which means millions of Ukrainians, are not refugees from the legal point of view. They are just immigrants, yes, and the immigrants who are going to probably stay here, they are enhanced to do everything to stay here in Poland. That's another question, of course, but uh, nevertheless. Of course, there was solidarity with the people. Of course, there was huge uh, media campaign. Uh, for, for the solidarity with uh, Ukraine as well as the state. Uh, and, uh, well, it worked for a few months, I think, but now, um, well, remember that according to the, the official data, the official uh, statistics, uh, Poland is a country which is, uh, the country which is more, more, most uh, struck by the economic crisis caused by this war in the in, in whole our continent, in Europe, we have minus 2.5 GDP rate, 
for the last three months of 2022, which means that we are in a deep crisis. This crisis will, of course, get worse. And uh, people are not thinking now about uh, helping Ukraine, helping Kiev and so on. People are, are thinking how to live up to the first day of the next month to pay all the bills and things like that. This is this is the main problem of Poland now and uh, of uh, people living here. And so uh, something has changed, of course. Now people are uh, directly forced to understand uh, what's going on there, yes. And uh, I don't think we have a kind of massive support for for the Ukrainian cause, as they like to to call it. We have rather fears of uh, uh, the escalation. We have rather people who are afraid, really afraid, and I agree with them. This is quite rational. Uh, and they are afraid that the war will, will spread on our territory, that we will be dragged to the war by the Anglo-Saxons as uh, another country when Ukrainians are finished, destroyed and so on, will be the next in the queue. Yes? So these are the um, basic feelings of uh, Polish people about uh, Ukraine at the moment being. We have to rescue ourselves. Yes, and first and foremost, we have to rescue our own families, our own friends, our own uh, communities, uh, and uh, this is something normal. So there are no so many Ukrainian flags waving uh, in uh, private flats or private uh, houses. You can still see them on the governmental buildings. You can still see, see them on the administration buildings, of course, because the policy hasn't changed. But uh, well, if you if you look at uh, the, the streets of the Polish cities, you cannot notice uh, Ukrainian flags waved by uh, private, ordinary people. Could you uh, say something about the rising pr prices? Because the official inflation in Poland it is 17 percent, but uh, if you can say some prices of bread, what was the price of bread uh, one year ago and today? What was the prices of renting uh, room uh, on or renting flat in 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 big cities? Uh, uh, because I have uh, impression that the the these these prices are growing much more than 17 percent uh, or something you can say also about the uh, rate of credits uh, how how big is the grow well last year? it depends when it comes to to uh, food prices uh, it was uh, i think it was the biggest growth uh, lately, uh, because uh, uh, the food prices, I think, uh, raised for about 50, 60 percent, 70 percent when it comes in to one summer. year. Yes, in one year, of course. You, you can just uh, compare the prices of, of basic uh, things like butter, bread, as you told, yes, uh, sugar, other things. And uh, uh, yes, it was uh, from 50 to 70 percent, according to uh, to the most data. Yes, so we have. Uh, when it comes to flat prices and uh, renting the flats in uh, Polish cities, yes, uh, the growth was about 30 percent, I think. Why? Because uh, first and foremost, we have our uh, uh, flats and uh, houses here in Poland massively rented by whom by the ukrainians if you have the influx of uh, people of several million of people here yes you can imagine that uh, many of them actually i think a uh, large part of, of the ukrainians living here are, are those who are quite well off yes so they even invest their money for instance uh, you have a nice picture of warsaw the polish capital behind you and when it comes to warsaw you see there are those high buildings, yes, and uh, with, with very high prices, of course, when it comes to apartments there. Uh, you know who is buying this most expensive apartments? In Warsaw? Mm. Ukraine. Oligarch, but this I don't know funny. which oligarch. No, 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 medium, uh, medium oligarchs. I mean, for, for, for Poland, for Poland, they would be oligarchs, of course, yes, for our standards, because uh, remember that 
uh, Ukrainian capitalist class is much richer than, than the Polish one. Yes, uh, so 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 I think that uh, uh, most of the of the of the uh, luxury flats in Warsaw in uh, several other cities are bought by by the Ukrainians. Other flats not so luxury, let's say standard level and and even the low level. Uh, accommodation uh, is also used by the Ukrainians. So we have the rising prices. It's something normal, yes? No. Uh, and uh, when it comes to uh, other, oh, let's say, basic things uh, you have to buy just to live, uh, we have to look, of course, at the price of electricity, yes? Which are partly regulated by, by the government. Nevertheless, the rise of the prices for uh, several entities, first and foremost for uh, small enterprises, was so high that uh, many people went bankrupt. So, so, so we can just tell that, uh, of course, uh, actually, the Polish government, this is also interesting, the Polish government doesn't want to give a detailed data on two things. We cannot get the answers to two basic questions. First, the real rise of costs of living in Poland. Uh, I mean, we, we have just uh, separate data for uh, different articles and different services and uh, wares. And uh, uh, second uh, question, which is uh, which remains unanswered, is, is the question about uh, the uh, amount of uh, Polish taxpayers' money which went to Ukraine in different forms. For instance, uh, with uh, military equipment, with financial aid, and so on and so on. And can you imagine that one of our uh, members of parliament, uh, Grzegorz Brown, uh, has even written a written question to the government about uh, the money which was already uh, given to, 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 to the Ukrainians and to, to the Ukrainian state, and he didn't get an answer. He, he got an, a very short answer that there are certain amounts of money which have been uh, transferred to the Ukrainians uh, who came here to Poland, yes, but, but he didn't get the complete answer for his question, uh, regard, regardless of the fact that he is a member of parliament and as a member of parliament he has the right for such information, yes, when he asks the government. So, funny thing, uh, some people claim that even the government, as we have total chaos in, in, our, in our government, that even the government doesn't know. But, uh, but, but of course, yes, because we have, you know, we have, we have several different agencies, uh, governmental agencies, but which are not uh, counted for the state budget. Yes, they are taken outside the state budget. So they don't have to report as uh, state entities report because they are to some extent out of control. Uh, but the money they use is, is the public money as well, yes? So, uh, we, we even don't have uh, rough estimates of, uh, of the money transferred to Ukraine and to Ukrainians. I don't know if I can agree that this money go to Ukraine. It goes for sure for Ukrainians, but I think the most of this money are now in the fiscal paradise in the in all of the the world, because the oligarch like uh, President Zelensky he placed his money not in Ukraine. He he is smart and he prepare uh, he pre prepare uh, prepares for his second life after emigration when all it will be finished uh, they will they will flee to ukraine and they will live the happy life of the emigrants like uh, today i don't know chikanowska for example uh, of course and we have a lot of uh, I, I i think we have hundreds of people in ukraine uh, who are uh, making huge business projects and earning a lot of money by, for instance, uh, organizing uh, uh, organizing uh, collecting of the funds for Ukrainian army. Yes, we have we have several information from there. Uh, remember that we are talking about the most corrupt country uh, in Europe. 
remember that we are talking about a country oh, just recently we but Poland or we, Ukraine <laughs> well Ukraine Ukraine for the moment being it's Ukraine but uh, it's also interesting because the Ukrainians bring corruption with themselves bring their habits we have to Poland, Ukrainization they, of Poland yes yes it is a part of the Ukrainization corruption as well because uh, for instance in football games yes we we didn't have we got rid of corruption in in Polish football several years ago you remember uh, we had a lot of scandals uh, around 20 years ago and so on, but we got rid of that. And lately, the official uh, Polish Football uh, Association uh, announced that uh, some Ukrainians, it's not the first uh, league of Polish uh, football, but uh, it's third, yes, if I'm not wrong, it's the third league of Polish football, started to sell the matches. Polish football matches of Polish uh, football teams, yes. So, so we have uh, uh, corruption, uh, reborn corruption in Poland, uh, thanks to uh, the, the Ukrainian immigrants and the Ukrainian habits they brought with them, yes, of course. But when it comes to uh, the Ukrainian army, remember that if you pay a euro or a zloty or whatsoever. Uh, any currency to Ukraine, you give it to people like uh, Reznikov, the Minister of Defense of Ukraine, who who was uh, known for for the fact that uh, he has bought eggs for the army for seventeen hryvnas, and the eggs at the market uh, in the at the market in Kiev cost seven hryvnas. Yes. So he, he just added officially 10 hryvnas and put it in his pocket and the pockets of his collaborators there. Yes? So, so it's something unbelievable yes, in, in, in a normal country. But uh, if you meet someone uh, near a shop, I think that uh, in every European country you can meet people who, uh, mostly Ukrainian, young Ukrainians, who, uh, who are begging you to, 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 to give them some uh, euros or, or, or zlotes for for the Ukrainian army to support Ukrainian army, yes? Don't do that because we are supporting Reznikov and his uh, companions there, yes, in, in, in Kiev. And you are not supporting Ukrainian army, if, even if you would like to support it, if, even if you sympathize with uh, Ukrainian army, you, you are just supporting the Ukrainian corrupt bureaucrats. It's a it's an interesting question about this begging for money because from Paris perspective, which is the I don't know I think the world capital of beggars uh, in every metro in every tourist place you have uh, people who who are doing this for for a living and it is uh, some mafia style organized uh, system that here the, this is the rome beggars that there are and uh, uh, i think that the uh, in paris uh, this amount of the ukrainians are much more smaller than in other cities because already this 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 market was monopolized by the other mafias uh, i i i didn't see uh, as many as uh, as in in, in poland there is some question. Um, I don't think they will Zelensky alive in any case. What do you think? Mm, well, if, if someone will kill Zelensky, this is the question. Yes. Uh, well, uh, Zelensky. No, I, I is... think I think that the the most uh, the, the examples of the other puppets, uh, U.S. puppets. And they they emigrated to, to 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 USA. The Batista from Cuba, the Kabul government, uh, the before it was the the Iran government before the Iranian Revolution, and the South Vietnamese. So so the the Americans uh, when they flee some puppet states, they always take some marionettes, some puppets with them. Uh, so I think that uh, already they have some plan evacuation for Zelensky, some members of Kim's family and some close members, uh, the, the close collaborators. Um, but the, uh, but the, the next, uh, the, 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 um, the rest of them will be sentenced. Well, I, uh, I think that uh, actually I, I wouldn't be so optimistic. 
uh, from the point of view of Zelensky, of course. Why? Because uh, remember the fate of uh, Hosni Mubarak in Egypt, for instance, yes? A close ally of the United States uh, in North Africa. And we could list here uh, a lot of uh, former leaders who were just, uh, well, I would say who were just uh, killed or uh, liquidated from the political life uh, by the hands of the pro-American uh, forces, even the pro-American cops. Yes? So, so they are not loyal to their people there, yes? They have their puppets, of course, but, but remember that this puppet, uh, by the way, this puppet is not 100% American, uh, in my opinion. This puppet is rather uh, British. I mean, uh, if you look at uh, uh, the map of influences in Ukraine, this is very interesting as well. Uh, the office of uh, the president and uh, the head of the office of president, Andriy Yermak and uh, uh, Zelensky himself, are more oriented at uh, London, and I think they are controlled by uh, London. You could notice uh, some British bodyguards with uh, Zelensky. He doesn't trust the Ukrainians, yes, so, so he has bodyguards directly uh, guarding him uh, from uh, United Kingdom. Which is which is which is quite interesting. Yes, I, I think this is uh, this this clearly shows that of course he's a puppet, and uh, as he's a puppet, he might be removed in different ways. Uh, an optimistic scenario is that they will take him to to Britain or to the United States. Uh, pessimistic scenario is that they will just uh, take him through Poland. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. More pessimistic for him, definitely. And the most pessimistic scenario is that they will use him as a kind of, uh, you know, symbolic sacrifice. For instance, they will shoot him and tell that it was the Russians. That's also possible, yes. That's also possible. How to look that the Russians are doing everything not to harm Zelensky. It's very interesting because every time when Zelensky comes to a, a city which is near the front line, uh the russian artillery stops shooting yes so so this is quite uh, quite interesting as well moscow does everything not to harm zelensky uh, joe biden during the presidential debate with donald trump in 2020 said that poland is an authoritarian country the outbreak of war further deepened and deepened the growing authoritarian tendency in, tendencies in Poland. Can you say something about the censorship of the weekly Myśl Polska, among others? Can you say something about the aggressive baiting of the opposition, which is regularly carried out by the minister Jaren, responsible for the secret services? Can you say something about people who, like you, in the past are currently locked up for political views? Janusz Niedźwiecki, Wojciech Olszański, and even Pablo Gonzalez, a Spanish citizen. Uh, do you agree with President Biden that Poland is an authoritarian country, or does it already meet the, in the criteria of the totalitarian state? Uh, well, it is, uh, I think it is uh, authoritarian, although we are all leaning towards uh, totalitarianism lately. This is not only about Poland, this is also about uh, other countries, uh, mainly in Europe. But of course, uh, Poland, uh, together with the Baltic states, uh, is becoming a kind of a leader when it comes to authoritarian and sometimes even totalitarian practices, yes? Uh, there's a slight difference between authoritarianism and totalitarianism, but according to the classic definition, yes, in uh, uh, authoritarianism, you can speak freely when you are not in the public sphere. Yes, so we can, you can speak uh, freely sitting uh, at the table with your friends. You can chat with uh, some people drinking uh, coffee in the restaurants or cafes somewhere. Uh, but you cannot speak uh, publicly, you cannot voice publicly your uh, dissident opinion. In a totalitarian state, this is different because you, you cannot uh, speak freely either in the public sphere, neither in the public sphere, neither in, uh, in the private sphere. Yes, and this is the main difference. And uh, when I'm talking to several professors, for instance, of the Warsaw University, uh, I learned that uh, a lot of them 
are afraid not only to speak publicly, to write something, to say something uh, on air, but they are even afraid to voice their opinions in private talks, in private at private meetings with their colleagues from uh, the university, because they fear that someone will record them or someone will just pass the information that, well, look, this guy is supporting, not supporting Ukraine, which means that he's supporting Russia, which means that he's an agent of Russian Federation, which means that we have to get rid of him to uh, throw him out, kick him out of the university and so on. Yes. So these are the, the elements of totalitarianism now in Poland. This is uh, something which makes a huge difference between Poland, I think, and and some other and some other uh, countries, uh, including European Union countries. Uh, we have uh, a very interesting remark. Yes, the prohibition of Dostoevsky and Tolstoy is also a totalitarian practice, of course, as well as. Uh, but they didn't prohibit Solzhenitsyn. Uh, not yet, but I, I have lately I have heard an interview with a guy, Paweł Reszka, a Polish uh, journalist who knew Russia quite well, and they were already discussing the ideas uh, that, uh, well, we should uh, look very critically at Solzhenitsyn as well. You know, this is Solzhenitsyn is... Uh, uh, being, you know, the, uh, uh, they have even criticized the, the, the heroes, former heroes ra from Russia of the West. So Zhenitsyn is on the blacklist. Uh, Yosif Brodsky is on the blacklist. Now, when it comes to Navalny, I don't know, but, 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 you, but you see that Navalny, by the way, Navalny and his people are not supporting uh, Ponomaryov and uh, all those guys who are now in Ukraine or the, the Russian neo-Nazis who are in uh, Ukraine and uh, you know, preparing terrorist attacks on the territory of uh, Russia from the territory of Ukraine, yes. They are not supported, by the way, by, by Navalny. Uh, I think you have noticed that there's also a difference that, the, 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 let's say, the liberals in Russia are not... Uh, um, well, I'll give, you, I'll give you one example, which is uh, about one of the meetings I had lately. I met... Uh, a Russian businessman, yes, uh, let's say quite high level businessman, he still, because he has different passports, so he can travel to Europe. And I met him in uh, Warsaw, we had a coffee, and he told me, you know, I was a vehement uh, critic of uh, Putin, of, of the Russian regime and so on. He's a hundred percent liberal. But, uh, you know, he told me that uh, now I have no other option. I have to support Russia because uh, the things which are happening with us in the West, uh, the things which we are they are trying to do with us in the West, are reminding the situation of the Jews during the Second World War, yes? So this is the fault of the West, uh, the collective West, that uh, it's not talking, it's also blocking those Russians who used to be very critical towards uh, Putin, towards uh, the Russian political system, yes? Solzhenitsyn was a big admirer of Bandera, we have uh, uh, such a remark. Uh, well, Solzhenitsyn from the 60s, from the 70s, and Solzhenitsyn from the 21st century or the, or the end of the 90s are two totally different persons. Uh, I mean, the latest books he, he wrote before he died were, uh, uh, I would say, quite uh, patriotic from the Russian point of view. Yes, he was against the Yeltsin times of privatization and so on. And so, so, so he was warning about that. So, uh, but before, of course, as a vehement anti-communist, he might be also uh, supporting, might have, have also supported in the past when he was young, all those nationalisms. Who were, uh, which were uh, anti-communist as well, yes. Uh, so, so this is uh, this is the case, I think. Yes. Anyway, uh, back to Poland. Uh, yes, we have uh, people politically repressed. Uh, you have mentioned some of them, but I would like to mention one more. Uh, I would like to mention Henrik Mikety, who is a seventy-one-year-old uh, retired guy from uh, the southwestern part of Poland and he just commented in his private Facebook something yes he commented that Putin uh, in, in his opinion uh, Putin was fighting for 
peace. You can agree with him, you can not agree with him, doesn't matter, yes? This was his private comment yeah? and his private opinion. Not voiced publicly, but voiced at, at uh, um, uh, Facebook profile, yes? Nothing more. And uh, because of that, he was sentenced, yes? He, he got uh, three months of jail, suspended, and a huge uh, fee. No, 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 no. It, it is eight months uh, he's eight months of uh, of jail but it suspended uh, for two years with suspension for two years uh, but but uh, there is one thing things which is not suspended it is the uh, very big money which he needs to uh, yes, he, 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 he has to uh, and this is a totalitarian practice because he has to publish an information about the verdict of the court against him uh, in the media for his own money as an advertisement yes this is a part of of the verdict this is a first instance verdict so we still hope that the appellation will help anyway this shows you uh, where we live i mean uh, these are the elements of uh, totalitarianism yes not only authoritarianism but uh, uh, we are very 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 close to totalitarianism you cannot voice your opinions even in private comments and, uh, in, in social media. So President Biden was right. So um, I don't care about uh, President Biden, to be honest, but uh, a lot of other people were right. And the people in the United States are happy still because uh, when it comes to censorship, well, I, I, I can access uh, several websites blocked in Poland via United States. Yes. Even the Russian state-owned media are available uh, via VPN in the United States, so they don't have such a kind of censorship there because of the, the American Constitution, I believe. Nevertheless, uh, here in Europe, of course, you mentioned Mishpolska. I would add uh, Mishpolska is uh, the oldest uh, um, still published uh, weekly uh, newspaper in Poland, uh, published since 1941. And uh, well, in the past there were different times. It was censored, of course, as well. But uh, now, since 26th of uh, February, the portal of uh, Mishpolska is censored by the Polish security services. So you cannot access it without VPN. Of course, we have a lot of readers who use VPN. We got too used to it. Yes. So, so a lot of people now learned how to do it, and they just put on VPN and uh, and access our website. Anyway. Uh, one of uh, the other titles which is censored now is, for instance, uh, Najwyższy Czas. I cannot agree with the contents of Najwyższy Czas because it's ultra libertarian and so on, yes? But it's also one of the oldest uh, newspapers, weekly newspapers, weekly magazines published in Poland. Their website was blo blocked as well, yes? So uh, this is a part of tot totalitarian practices. And according to the Polish constitution, uh, to the Article 54 of the Polish Constitution, uh, any kind of preventive censorship is banned in Poland. So the authorities, uh, Polish authorities, Polish uh, political police, is uh, it's quite clear they are violating the Constitution without any consequence. I didn't mention Henrik Miketen because he's not uh, he's not in prison. He he was uh, uh, the the other guy which I I said they are locked in prison, and uh, one of the reason why I talk about it is the appeal for the viewers from other countries to uh, to listen to this that there are some people in the Polish prisons and they need to be helped, they need to be uh, these cases uh, uh, Janusz Niedźwiecki, he is in prison I don't know, since uh, two years almost, now. Almost two years uh, yes, mm -hmm. since May 2021 and this uh, journalist from Spain, Spain uh, he, he was arrested in the first days of, of war and uh, and nobody, uh, I, I think that even people in Spain don't, don't know that the Sp Spanish citizens in a citizen is now in the Polish prison. 
So um, it's uh, it's something that we need uh, we need support help uh, from the uh, solidarity from other countries uh, talked about the political prisoners in Poland because uh, uh, because if not uh, I don't know who will stop the, the 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 crazy Polish authorities no one will stop them but uh, of course we need to talk about that we need to talk about all those people to mention their names i'm glad that you have mentioned uh, those names uh, we need to remember that uh, those people are, un are unlawfully kept uh, in custody uh, to be honest uh, poland is a leading country when it comes uh, to people being kept uh, arrested uh, without any uh, court verdict so they are not uh, found guilty of any crimes a lot of uh, people like uh, Janusz Niedźwiecki actually are accused of doing something which is according to the penal codex of Poland which is not a crime this is a, this is the same situation as it was with me yes so so the people are accused for instance for uh, shaping public opinion which means that the people are accused of voicing their opinion publicly yes uh, so uh, i think that uh, this is something which would be well unbelievable and uh, unaccepted definitely uh, in uh, most of other european union countries there are four countries uh, in Europe, in European Union, which are following the Ukrainian example. It's Ukraine, which is the le least democratic country in the whole of our continent, as you know, because they have banned the political parties, closed TV channels, closed the media, arrested uh, or killed even the um, political activists uh, there but there are four countries following the ukrainian example it's poland it's lithuania latvia and estonia uh, we could mention as well several people in uh, uh, lithuania for instance argir daspaletskis who is uh, kept in prison i think he got a sentence for six and a half year or something like that uh, we have uh, uh, Alexander Gaponenko, Professor Alexander Gaponenko from uh, Latvia, who was also kept in prison, in jail for over one year. We have uh, Sergei Seredenko in uh, Estonia, a human rights activist there, who is uh, who got a sentence of about six years, yes, just for voicing his opinion. So we are talking about th uh, four countries which are following the Ukrainian model, the Ukrainian model of uh first step authoritarian state and then a kind of evolution towards a more totalitarian model i would like also comment this question of the liberals in emigration that uh, i make interview with archom dubsky he is a belarusian citizen who participated in the anti Lukashenko demonstration a few years ago. He was even in prison in Białoruś. Uh, he was in the list of Amnesty International, like a victim of the regime of the Biwa Lukashenko. And when he came to, to Poland, he worked in the Belarusian house of uh, uh, it is it is the organization founded by the Polish government to to organize the opposition anti Lukashenko in in Poland uh, and he talked with me uh, about all this corruption there how the one uh, one liberal uh, Belarusian leader hate other liberals from Belarusia because it is all the question of money and now all them hate uh, Cichanowska because it's it's her which take all this money which are uh, going to the, uh, the, the opposition uh, and it is very funny that he came to Poland like a very very um, uh, opponent of Lukashenko and now he became uh, mm, the critic of the Polish government the critic of the Cichanowska in his uh, YouTube channel and, uh, and in Telegram because he was censored in YouTube 
he he make a lot of videos uh, against the banderites uh, against the polish propaganda uh, now he is now now in this moment he is in 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 donbas like a journalist he make a lot of videos he he shown all, all these cases so we see how uh, it's this this opposition founded and corrupted by the western countries how it is something from his uh, from his perspective we see uh, what is uh, the, the, this is all uh, only corrupted people which are thinking only about money and it is one of the reason why nobody supported them in in Belarus well uh, in uh, Belarus we can say that uh, being an opposition activist became a business and this is something very interesting by the way to look at the conflicts and quarrels internal conflicts uh, between the members of the Russian opposition also those who are based in Poland now they are fighting for money fighting for every possibility to get something uh, from another foundations western foundations they are fighting for uh let's say influences uh, they are getting the grants for different projects and so on so that's something obvious that i i can imagine a situation of a young uh, belarusian who is uh, uh, let's say an idealist member of the belarusian opposition yes uh, because certainly there are people who are against uh, lukashenko who are uh, quite idealistic and think that uh, when Lukashenko falls, the, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the knights of the opposition, the honorable knights of the opposition will save Belarus and Belarusian people. And of course, when they come uh, to Poland or when they come to any other Western countries, they simply notice that uh, all it is about it's about money it's about uh, some uh, corruption practices and so on so i think that now the belarusian opposition is actually in a, a kind of panic because uh, you remember juan guaido yes. from venezuela of course yes uh, but you remember you, you remember him because you are you, you are discussing and uh, analyzing and you are in, interested in, in politics but most of the people don't remember who was Juan Guaido. Uh, they forgot about him. He was an American project, yes, for for, for Venezuela, as uh, as uh, Tikhanovskaya is. Yes, he, was, he was American project, but pushed by the Colombian mafia. Yes, of course, of course. This is uh, also quite interesting. Anyway, he was first promoted, uh, pumped with uh, funding from uh, different. Uh, foreign sponsors and so on. He was taken to several meetings, summits, uh, conferences, and now, now no one needs him. No one uh, remembers about him. And I think that the Belarusian opposition with the Tikhanovska in his head, they also uh, understand that their time is almost gone, that, that they have to steal as much as it's possible because very soon no one will remember about Tikhanovska and no one will fund her projects. Yeah, but how how it's finished this history with Guaido? But because there is the question of the gold and the Venezuelan gold in Bank of London, uh, and uh, the authorities uh, of England said that now this gold is the property of the uh, government of Guaido, and uh, the government of Maduro don't have access for this gold. Which which, which means that uh, the Anglo-Saxons are using, keeping, and using this gold. This is quite obvious. You know, uh, Kes van der Peyl, a great uh, academic from the Netherlands and the author of a book uh, about Ukraine, one of the best ones, I think, uh, claims, for instance, and he has found some very interesting information that uh, where, do you know where is the Ukrainian gold? In London? <laughs> No, in USA? In, 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 in USA, in USA, of course. And uh, do you know when it was taken uh, to the USA? It was taken in 2014, just after the coup. So the new authorities, illegal authorities of Ukraine, uh, agreed, the central bank authorities of Ukraine, agreed 
uh, that several tons, I think it was 54 tons or something like that, would be taken to the U.S. for security reasons, as they, as they say, yes. But the U.S. keeps that gold, Ukrainian gold. So the U.S. has robbed Ukraine as well, yeah. In the last speech of the President Putin, he mentioned that the oligarch, uh, the property which were taken, uh, the property which they had in the Western countries, so the, the villas, the yachts, uh, were taken by the uh, European authorities. And he said, uh, it was better for you invest your money in Russia. And the question is for me, how it is possible that the government of Venezuela, the socialist, anti-imperialist government of Venezuela, uh, which existed uh, already 20 years, he didn't take their, their gold from the, from the uh, London. Uh, for me, it is something very stupid. Well, uh, I think this is the matter of, you know, lack of uh, the instruments to press at uh, London or United States in, in such cases. Uh, I mean, the, even even uh, as you remember, uh, even the Russians yes, kept a lot of their uh, reserves, gold reserves, and uh, uh, also currency, foreign currency reserves in uh, um, other countries. Yes, so uh, the theory which convinces me the most is that we have the, the so-called uh, financial pivot of the modern world uh, well before we were speaking often in geopolitical terms about the heartland as a geographic geographical term you remember yes but now we uh, can talk about the heartland in financial terms and this heartland of the modern world is of course uh, london i mean the london city and uh, um, uh, New York uh, as such a kind of axis, yes, which is controlling all financial flows uh, in the world, basically. So I think that uh, you mentioned socialist governments who, who agreed to have their gold cap there. Uh, they didn't have any other option. They were too weak to get it back. Historical policy is the foundation of the current government it is the constant reminder of successive anniversaries, not a ben usually tragic events such as the Warsaw Uprising, to a large extent shaped the millions of Poles who have been voting for PIS for several years. What can you say about the attitude of Polish historians and politicians towards the growing cult of UPA, UPA, criminals in U Ukraine? Do the Polish authorities mind the red and black UPA flag ostentatiously worn by the Ukrainians of Polish streets? Do the Polish authorities, uh, authorities mind the song of the UPA Czerwona Kalena? The cult of Bandera is officially forbidden in Poland. Have you heard of any case of someone going to prison for getting a tattoo of Bandera or another Ukrainian criminal responsible for the Wojnian massacre? Well, uh, when it comes to the um, uh, historical policy of uh, modern Ukraine, modern Ukraine, uh, I think in 2015, if I'm not wrong, has uh, introduced the Polish model, yes. So uh, with, with this Institute of uh, National Remembrance, you know, you know, even even the name of the institution is the same in Ukraine and in Poland. The first one was the Polish one, of course. The um, whole idea, the sole idea of, uh, uh, let's say, historical policy or, or political approach to history is a kind of absurd from from an academic point of view, yes, because. Uh, even the um, basic aims and official goals of those institutions indicate that uh, those guys are not, those institutions are not supporting uh, academic researchers, uh, publishing books and so on, but they are just uh, doing some part of propaganda, yes? Which is, uh, which is uh, their real job now, yes? When it comes to the symbolism, we, uh, well, mm, several years ago I have, uh, lately read uh, about some uh, 
cases when uh, the Ukrainians were stopped by the Polish people, for instance, in Rzeszów, because they were some stickers on their cars with uh, the banderist uh, flags, I mean the red, black, whites. Yes? And the police came and they were, you know, cases against the Ukrainians for spreading uh, the uh, fascist uh, ideology. Uh, can you imagine something like that now? Not. They are publicly, as you, as you have mentioned, they are publicly using the, the symbolism. They are publicly using not only the neo banderist uh, symbolism, they are publicly using uh, um, openly neo Nazi symbolism in uh, Ukraine. And this is something normal now. Yes? Yeah. So they come here to Poland and they do the, do the same. No one will, will touch them even, yes, because if, if uh, according to the law, if someone would uh, would react, uh, well, I think that the, the next day the prosecutor's office will uh, reject um, uh, the whole case, will close the whole case, and uh, don't care about that. So, so on, on the symbolical level, yes, everything is now different and has nothing to do with the legal basis and legal framework we have in Poland, everything is tolerated from that point of view. But do you think that uh, uh, the Polish politicians, which I, which now have, they are in power in Poland, uh, what do they think about this? It is their idea or the, they are uh, listening the orders from the Britain and USA because I can't I can't imagine how it is possible that the this uh, this nationalist from uh, from these ruling parties they accept this uh, even the Duda in 2015 when he make uh, in the time of the election he promised to the families of the uh, the people killed in Vowen that he will he will defend their their cases it is Duda which in 2015 defended the cases of the 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 the, the, the families killed in the vowing to to make some monuments about this uh, uh, exhumation uh, and also he will push the government of ukraine to uh, to excuse excuse and something like this and now he makes something totally the opposite uh, so they change their they view or it is the orders from the usa i don't know this is the question to them <laughs> But they, they they don't want to talk about that yes so so they cannot ask for you personally. Uh, no, I think that this that this is a framework of new political correctness, and uh, you know that uh, this is not maybe the the direct uh, order, but but those people just feel what is politically correct and what is not. You know, I'll give you another example, which is an example from ordinary life uh, i was lately talking to one of the deans of one of uh, small polish uh, universities and the guy the guy is uh, historian yes and he came and uh, told me that he wants to organize a conference about genocide genocide in international relations and in international law yes and then he told me that i would like to discuss the, the ukrainian topic when you hear genocide and Ukrainian topic, I was I was sure that he uh, he means uh, the Voi massacre and the genocide of the Polish, uh, the Jews, uh, and the Ukrainians as well, uh, by uh, the Ukrainian UPA army yes, and Banderists. Uh, this would be something obvious for me. So I told him, I answered him very politely that you know you will have uh, several problems when you organize uh, any kind of conference on these topics nowadays in Poland. Because this is true, because he would, he would be attacked because of organizing something like that. And then, uh, you know what was his reaction and his answer? He told me, no, I was meaning the Russian genocide, uh, which started in 2022 in Ukraine. Uh, no, and I was shocked, and it and it was a guy who is an academic and so on, yes, uh, which, uh, who is who is completely misunderstanding the, the 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 basic notions from history, from international relations, and so on, yes. 
so uh, this is uh, this is where we are when it comes to uh, um, I, I would say very shortly just just trying to answer your question I think that those people are um, willing uh, to support any kind of ideology any kind literally any kind of uh, most extremist ideology if this ideology is anti-russia if it's directed against russia they don't care about the roots of this ideology they don't care about the stance of this ideology towards poland this is something which is not important for them this doesn't count for them uh, they just care that the ide ideology is anti-russia this is the only thing uh, they are worried about and does anybody knows how many poles are currently fighting on the side of the ukrainians and how many have have already lost their uh, lost their lives you made uh, a conversation about this i don't know one or two weeks ago in the mino tydzień myśl polska so could you summarize to what did you talk uh, to summarize we don't have uh, any idea of uh, which which would help us uh, to answer this question we know that they are uh, polish citizens uh, we don't know how many of them uh, there are we don't know who they are although we lately learned that uh, some members of police units are uh, fighting the, 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 the not the russians but the mines are helping to, 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 to liquidate the minefields in uh, Ukraine. And this is the first information about uh, official Polish structure, the police, uh, as uh, the government informed, which is there on the territory of uh, Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to the numbers, we really don't know. Uh, when the Russians ask me this question, I ask them another one. I am asking them always the question, where are um, the people whom you called there on the field, the Polish ones, the war prisoners from Poland? And they asked for well, nothing. I haven't seen anyone uh, in the Russian media. Yes? I mean, just uh, if they would show us the guy who, who is a war prisoner, a prisoner of war there, who was taken by the Russians, and who would tell us about uh, how the things really are, maybe we would uh, learn something more. So I do not believe the Russian claims that there are several tens of thousands of Polish people, because if that would if that would be true, first, the Russians would show a prisoner of war with, politic, with, with Polish citizenship. Second, uh, if uh, thousands of them would be dead, then, uh, oh, Michal, you know Poland. So you know that people would gossip about that, yes? that uh, in the social media, everywhere, the, the families of those people who were killed there, I mean, if the numbers would be very big, if the numbers would go to thousands, yes, we would hear about that. And we have heard mm, of about, I don't know, maybe dozen or, or two dozens of uh, mm, uh, funerals of those people who were killed, who are mercenaries and who had uh, Polish citizenship. So we don't have the answers. Well, the only answer we have, we have is that, yes, unfortunately, uh, Polish citizens, like the French citizens, like the German citizens, like American citizens, are there as mercenaries. How many of them? We don't know. Yes, but we have some numbers. Um, maybe not uh, di directly connected with the war, but we have very important numbers of the counting uh, the number of polls in the in the 20 uh, 2022 there was a, a number that there was 305000 pe people which are born in poland 300005 and we have 4, 450,000 people who died. So the Polish population is smaller, 145,000 people. Yeah, this, is, and this is the worst result since the Second World War. 
you know yes 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 yes, yes. but i i think that uh, uh, majority of the of these people uh, which died is of course the people who are old but uh, if somebody will look the 20 the guys we are 20 years old 30 or 40 i think that uh, most of them uh, uh, some of them uh, it, it, they died in in ukraine so we have uh, um, there are uh, because uh, this uh, maybe the government can not show the um, uh, can hide this information about the uh, activity of the Polish mercenaries in Ukraine, but can't hide uh, that uh, these people are no longer exist. They they, they died. They uh, even without uh, official um, ceremony in the cemetery. Uh, they, uh, if somebody which is in good good shape, in good form, and have 30 years old, and he died, uh, it is something which uh, we need to um, think that. Uh, my my yes. opinion is that yes. this is possible. This is possible, of course, but uh, uh, we don't know the scale. Yes, uh, uh, and uh, oh, please uh, remember also that uh, the Polish healthcare system is killing uh, our own citizens since many years, particularly since uh, 2020. And uh, the lack of, uh, of funding of the Polish healthcare system. Yeah? So I personally have a lot of friends, uh, had a lot of friends who died at the age of uh, 35, 40, 45, um, because, of, because of, of, of lack of healthcare here in Poland, yes? So we must take that into account as well. But I cannot exclude that you are right. I cannot exclude that, yes. Just, just we don't have, for the moment being, we don't have, we can only guess what happened to those people, yes. So Because we don't have hard uh, data and hard confirmation of what the situation really is. But it's very scary that if Poland is, isn't in war and already in the time of peace, the Poland lose... Uh, uh, 145,000 citizens in one no, year without our war. our uh, our healthcare system i mean not not the healthcare system of course it's all but the neoliberal governments uh, of poland since 1989 are at war with polish citizens so and this is the reason yes they are at war with, with us Okay, and my last question. Uh, I would like to ask about anti-war initiatives to, that have recently appeared in Poland. Can you say something about the Kamrad community in the at the, in the uh, January 19 demonstration in Warsaw? Can you say something about the Polish anti-war movement of Leszek Sikulski and Sebastian Piton? Can you say something about Professor Maria Szyszkowska Peace Congress? Can you finally say a few words about the anti-war debates organized by Mesh Polska? Do you see any chance of cooperation of anti-war circles in Poland? Do you support establishing cooperation with opponents of the war from Germany, the Czech Republic, and even from the USA? Mm, yes, when it comes to um, all the people you have mentioned, those people have have had done very, very much to spread uh, uh, the knowledge about uh, the threats we are facing now. I mean, uh, Professor Szyszkowska, uh, oh, but uh, Sekulski and Piton as well, yes, by, by, by taking to the public the issues which are not covered by the mainstream media. When it comes to uh, the uh, you showed the demonstration now, I think, of the, of the comrades movement, yes? Yes, yes. Uh, so uh, I haven't been there, but I have uh, some friends who are participating in that. And it was quite impressive because uh, it was around uh, one and a half thousand uh, for Poland. Let's let explain our audience that uh, for Poland it's, uh, it's a big demonstration because Poles are usually sitting homes, even if they are supporting the opposition or opposing something they prefer to sit homes and to 
uh, you know, to, to, to criticize the government uh, in their kitchens and uh, living rooms, but not going to the streets, particularly in the winter, as you see, yes? Uh, so uh, I have heard a lot that uh, and this is a kind of phenomenon, I mean, the movement uh, who organize, which organized that, and I think they have uh, quite impressive possibilities to mobilize people. Well, I, I wish them the best. When it comes to uh, the other movements, uh, people, forums, uh, I think that I think there's a lot of uh, such uh, structures now, and I'm very glad that there's a lot of different uh, grassroots activism uh, in Poland, and I don't want to. Uh, create a kind of uh, one single umbrella for all those organizations. You know why? Because we have already told our, our viewers that we are living in an authoritarian uh, state, leaning towards uh, totalitarianism. And any kind of anti-system opposition movement, in this case anti-war movement, may, would be very easily destroyed, infiltrated and so on, if it would have one organizational basis. So I'm really glad that we have, uh, let's uh, use the historical quotation, you know whom, that we have thousand flowers blossoming, yes, of the of the anti-war movement. The chairman of Mao. Of course, of course, of course. Yeah, I know that you know, knew that, yes. So uh, we have uh, those uh, anti-war flowers blossoming in Poland. I'm very glad. I'm supportive for every initiative regardless uh, other political positions because uh, remember that uh, the anti-war uh, tendencies in Poland are coming from the li uh, from the right side of the political spectrum from the left side of the political spectrum from the socialists from the communists but also from the nationalists from different political camps you know that's very uh, very interesting and uh, uh, we are living in a moment when I don't want to to criticize someone uh, or to refuse someone uh, the uh, possibility and the right to participate in the anti-war movement. We need everyone and we need uh, many different grassroots structures. Uh, so I'm really supporting that. Uh, when it comes to contacts with uh, other countries, uh, Sebastian Piton told me that they were lately visiting an uh, anti-war demonstration in Slovakia, for instance. So uh, it's something obvious, you know. Uh, we, have, uh, we, we are under the risk of uh, the Third World War, which uh, which could be provoked by some uh, hoax, war hoax in Washington and uh, in London, yes. And if we are in such a danger and if we are facing such a risk, we should uh, create an anti-war movement, uh, which is by definition an international movement. So I also hope that there will be some contacts, thanks to you, some contacts between the anti-war movement in France, for instance, and, and the anti-war movements in uh, Poland. So we all have to meet, we all have to discuss, we all have to exchange uh, ideas between ourselves. And uh, Poland is uh, on the front line yeah, for the moment being. We are, the risk here is much, much bigger than the risk in France yeah, of, of, of escalation, of dragging us into the war. So. Uh, I think that uh, uh, the peace uh, activists, anti-war activists from different countries should uh, look at Poland, should come to Poland, should visit us, should talk to us, should, should uh, be ready to uh, organize common uh, demonstrations, common uh, conferences, discussions and so on. I really hope for that. And uh, by the way, the anti-war movement in the United States as well. Yes, I, I, I'm really um uh, proud of the fact that uh, you and also me when it comes to Mishpolska, we had lately uh, an opportunity to talk to Scott Ritter, which is uh, not only a military analytic, but uh, we might tell that he is a part of uh, American anti-war movement, yes? 
in this channel i talked a few days ago with comrade uh, alex from the communistische organization in germany and he participated in the big demonstration um, in berlin one week ago and there was uh, 50000 uh, people in the um, in the center of berlin near the brandenburgian gate and uh, i hope that uh, that this this number of 50000 people and the number of the german citizen who signed the petition anti war petition prepared by the sarah wagenknecht uh, that uh, um, i hope that uh, there will be some collaboration because german is berlin is is very very close from 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 your native city Szczecin, from Poznan, or even from Warsaw, uh, and some some pol uh, poles will go to to next demonstration in Berlin, and also some <clears throat> comrades from Berlin will came to Poland uh, because uh, uh, this demonstration organized by the comrade movement it's good, but it was small comparing to this in, in Berlin. And it's good idea to go to the and also to Prague because the, the in, in Czech Republic there was also very very big even bigger demonstration than in in in, in Germany. I, I I only said about one day demonstration. The, the biggest was in in Prague. Uh, because in Germany they there are a lot of demonstration, but in the different cities. Uh, so um, so the Pol the Poles can uh, learn something from the organizers from uh, from Czech and, and Germany, and it will be good for every uh, for everybody. Well, I I really hope that uh, we will cooperate very closely with the Germans as well. Uh, when it comes to Germany, by the way, uh, it's also very interesting that the German uh, anti-war movement uh, comes from different political camps, from different different political parties. Uh, on the one hand, uh, I think that the, the most important voice of the anti-war movement was uh, actually the voice of Sarah Wagenknecht. You have mentioned her. She was there with uh, Oscar Lafontaine as well. Uh, at the demonstration in Berlin, uh, but uh, on the other hand, you have also those at least some groups from uh, Alternative for Germany, which are also voicing anti-war uh, uh, slogans uh, for the moment. Yes, so you have different people from from different political camps. I think that the goal is common, and uh, we should cooperate regardless of uh, all. Uh, differences, political differences between different political parties. Uh, of course, we, we will go back to the differences, we will even go back to the conflicts we used to have, uh, to the quarrels, political quarrels, uh, when, uh, uh, when we save our countries from those who want to drag us into the war. Because if they win, our discussions about economy, about society about all other issues will be pointless because we won't exist anymore yeah, this is the site of this small organization which i mentioned yes uh, we, we, with pleasure with pleasure we would invite them to poland and uh, maybe uh, suggest to, to 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 organize a common polish german uh, events against nato not against russia again mm. okay so so i will continue the the discussion with comrades from communistische organization uh, i'll be maybe i will invite you to make some 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 connection so thank you mateus for for today mm. It is. I, I hope that uh, all this subject which you talked, I already knew, but uh, I hope that the people from other countries uh, will learn something about Poland and uh, <clears throat> and because of the strategic position in Poland and uh, the 
the the pushing the pushing the because the so many ukrainians who already died uh, the the possibility of the involving poland to this war is growing and growing so so i appeal to the anti-war activists from all over the world mm, let's uh, be against uh, be against the involving poland to this war because it will be involving of nato and it is very dangerous for the for the future of the mankind yes the humankind is at risk because of some warmongers uh, unfortunately some of them are from poland okay so thank you very much um, thanks a lot and uh, all the best to our viewers